Hello, Solar Eclipse Timer users. This is Dr. Telepin checking back in. It is really exciting to feel the temperature drop during a solar eclipse. It is one of the main partial phase phenomena. To make this the best YouTube channel with information about solar eclipses, we need to talk about temperature changes. I actually messed up my temperature data collection during this last eclipse. Let's use this episode to talk about it. Fifteen minutes until totality. Observe decrease in ambient temperature. My first eclipse was in Africa in June of 2001. This is during the dry season and we were in a big field in the countryside. The temperature drop was dramatic. I mean, I felt an amazing amount of temperature change. I was so impressed that I made a comment about it, which is recorded on my Eclipse Day video. Since that was my first eclipse, I was worried about a bunch of other things, especially regarding the photography so I did not even think to monitor the temperature. Sometime after the eclipse, Fred Espinick published his report about his eclipse experience. He was observing in a neighboring field, so our observing positions were very close together, and therefore our ambient conditions would have been the same. In his group, he had some meteorologists that were taking temperature readings. They recorded an 11 degree Celsius drop in temperature for that eclipse. That is a lot. In Fahrenheit, that is about an 18 degree drop in one and a half hours. Here is my video clip from 2001 when I made that temperature comment. It's definitely cool. I mean, it's almost getting cold. Uh, crickets are starting to uh, chirp in the field behind us. Um, and uh, the lighting is definitely changing. Uh, it's getting dimmer. Also after that eclipse, I met up with one of my NASA friends, Mitzi Adams, who is a solar scientist and was also in Africa for that same eclipse. She observed the eclipse in downtown Lusaka, Zambia from the rooftop of her hotel and did a temperature data log. She recorded about an 11 degree Fahrenheit drop in temperature in downtown Lusaka. Here's a graph of her data. When I saw her temperature curve graph, I thought it was really neat and I wanted to do one on my own. So I borrowed her temperature data logger called the Thermocron I button and took it to Zimbabwe, Africa in 2002 and did my own data log. Here is my graph. I recorded an 8.1 degree Fahrenheit drop in temperature. For the 2006 eclipse, I was observing on a moving ship, so I don't recall being aware of the temperature change. For this last eclipse, at our observing position, someone in my group recorded a temperature drop of 12 degrees Fahrenheit. The peak temperature was 94 degrees and it dropped to 82 degrees. He did not do data logging so he could not make a graph. I was doing data logging but messed it up. We will talk about that later. Let's discuss what is happening with the temperature drop. Now, this is not an atmospheric heating lecture. I am talking in very general terms now for the purposes of this video. During the daytime, the Earth is subjected to all of the wavelengths of energy that come from the sun. This is called the solar radiation. Out of all of the solar radiation that travels through space from the sun to the Earth on a clear day, hopefully eclipse day, about 50% of it reaches the ground to get absorbed by the Earth's surface and cause heating. So on eclipse day, solar radiation is being absorbed at your observing position causes heating. The ground also then re-emits energy at an altered wavelength. And both of these things are creating your ambient temperature. As the eclipse progresses and the moon is covering more and more of the sun, less solar radiation is reaching your observing position. Since this is over a long period of time, first contact to second contact, and the solar radiation is progressively becoming less and less and less, your observing position has a chance to cool. The amount of temperature drop you will be able to record depends on many factors, such as your observing position's ground cover, what are its characteristics for absorbing and releasing energy? The air circulation, is there a breeze mixing the air? The duration of the eclipse, 
meaning the size of the deepening pen umbra and the umbra, the setup of your recording equipment. The changes you perceive on your skin can also be affected a little by the humidity. If you want to do this at your next eclipse, consider some basic points about the setup of the experiment. Set up the recording device about three to four feet off the ground. You want to be recording the air temperature at this height. Allow air circulation around your device. The recording device must be in good shade. It must be blocked from direct sunlight. Use a recording device that is small and does not have a large thermal mass so it can respond to the temperature changes quickly. Take readings about every 30 to 60 seconds. There is no reason to take readings more rapidly than that. When preparing for this last eclipse, I had so many things going on. I was supporting the Solar Eclipse Timer app, making arrangements for the group of 30 people that I was taking to the eclipse, and planning my own video and photography plan. That left worrying about doing temperature logging to a couple of weeks before the eclipse. That was a big mistake. I messed up with number three, four, and five of the list I discussed before. Let's go back and talk about how I did it correctly in 2002. Here's a picture of that setup. It was a morning eclipse, so back to the graph, you see that we still had some morning heating after first contact. I had the thermocron hanging in the middle of these tripod legs. It was protected from the sun by this white towel, but the backside was open for air circulation. I got good data at that eclipse. The thermocron is interesting. Back then, you programmed it through a COM serial connection to a Windows computer using the old terminal program. But the beauty of this data logger is its small size. It has very little thermal mass, so it responds to the temperature changes quickly. Here's how I messed up at the last eclipse. I borrowed my friend's Thermocron again, the one I used in 2002 because I was familiar with it. A couple of weeks before the eclipse, I tried to program it. Well, I could not get it to work. I don't know if it was a software issue or the, or the battery in the logger was dead. But anyway, the last week before the eclipse, I had to find something to use. I looked online and I could not find anyone who had a Thermocron in stock in the model number that I needed. I had to find something I could get in a couple of days. So after some quick research, I got a device I felt would work. That was the x 42270. It seemed reasonable. Like the Thermocron, I could use a computer to program all the parameters ahead of time. And it had a docking station and used a newer USB connection. I programmed and tested the x at home about three days before the eclipse. I felt comfortable that I could program it for the eclipse. On eclipse day, I hung it in the middle of tripod legs in the shade of a white towel just like I did in 2002. I thought things were fine. Then, the day after the eclipse, I downloaded the data and only had a temperature drop of about two degrees. Remember, someone in my group had recorded a total change of 12 degrees. I had to figure out what I did wrong. For this past eclipse, we were on the top of a grassy hill. We arrived about 9 a.m. First contact was at 1.04 p.m., so the hilltop had all morning to be heated up by the sun. There was no breeze that morning. So out of the five steps listed above, in retrospect, here is what I think about my data collection problems. The height of the data collection, I did that correctly, about four feet off the ground. Air circulation, I did that correctly. The device had free airflow around it. Good shade. I used a white towel like I did in 2002, but I think I messed up here. I don't think my towel for this last eclipse was weaved densely enough to provide good shade. Also, I think I had heat rising from the ground. Here's why. In 2002, it was a morning eclipse. C2 was at 8.18 a.m. and the sun angle was lower in the sky at 42 degrees. At that eclipse, the ground below the experiment did not have time to heat up. This last eclipse was in the afternoon. 
C2 was at 2.32 p.m. The sun, rising to an altitude of 62 degrees, had many hours to heat the ground at the observing site. Device with a small thermal mass. This was my biggest error. I completely missed taking the size of this device into consideration and the fact that the sensor probe is located within the upper cover of the device. So any heat retained by the device is going to heat the probe. Basically, the entire mass of the device has to cool down before the probe will cool down. In addition, I think my device was still being heated by energy through the towel and energy up from the ground. Sampling rate. I also made a mistake here because I set the sampling rate to two seconds. That is sampling too quickly. So my data storage in the device got filled up and data points stopped getting collected at about 20 minutes after third contact. So how will I do it differently at the next eclipse? First, I will shade the device better. I will use a denser weaved white towel and have tin foil behind the towel as a better radiant barrier. I will also use this barrier to the bottom side of the device to block ground heat, but will leave good airflow everywhere else. I will buy a device with a small thermal mass, like a new version of the iButton Thermocron, or I will buy a temperature logger that uses a thin probe on a wire which puts it away from the device case. Third, I will sample in the range of every 30 to 60 seconds and make sure I understand how many data points the device will retain. I want to start getting data about an hour before first contact and continue getting data until a few minutes after fourth contact. Thank you for watching this Solar Eclipse Timer episode. I hope you now understand how to record the temperature changes during a solar eclipse if you ever attempt to do it for yourself. If you find this episode helpful, please subscribe by clicking the subscribe button below. Also click on the little bell that will pop up. That will make sure you are notified when I release new episodes about other partial phase phenomena and other eclipse information. Also, post comments and questions. If you don't feel like subscribing now, that's okay too. Just check in on this channel because my goal is to make it the best YouTube channel to prepare people for solar eclipses. Try to get to the next eclipse. Thanks again. I appreciate your time.